What's up, Radiant Church? How you guys doing? Good to see you. Hey, can we give it up for our Sarah, our update young lady? She is so amazing. <laughs> I didn't see that one ahead of time, and so I love the like chipmunk effect she put on there about, we're killing it this week, and no, that was funny. Funny to me. Anyway, hey, before we dive into the word, I just want to reiterate something that she said about uh, Saturday night. Some of you might be wondering. Even some of our, our Portage people uh, attend on Saturday nights as well. And so what we are doing is just trying to, as an executive team, we came together and we're just trying to say, what, what is, how can we maximize every single thing that we do at Radiant Church? Uh, if you've been here a while, you know that we're not afraid to kind of shuffle some things and change some things. We usually just shake a magic eight ball, try to see what uh, to do next. Sorry. Okay, we don't do that. Uh, we do, we pray, and we seek the Lord. And so this, this Saturday night change is uh, really designed to see what it's going to look like, as Sarah said, to just have a, a bit of a different worship component. So we're going to linger a little while in worship. We're going to uh, purposely make some time at the end for ministry and, and prophetic ministry and altar ministry, and the message will remain basically the same. And we are shifting uh, the time to six o'clock. I hope that works for everyone. We did get feedback that sometimes the five o'clock kind of falls right into kids' dinner times and things like that. So we, we backed it up an hour. So hopefully we'll see all of you and then some uh, on Saturday nights. But we really are excited starting in February about what Saturday nights are going to look like. It's going to be good. So just clap. Okay, yes. Okay, good. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so good. So hey, if you brought your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And as you do, Pastor Lee is ministering at a radiant church in Kansas City, uh, David Perkins Church. It's the first time I think that he's been there. He tried to go last year and he got snowed out, so he's ministering there. And uh, if you weren't here last week, we're starting a brand new series. It's called Saints and Sinners, and it's about identity. And what Pastor Lee said is the Lord really spoke to him, 2018 is going to be a year of identity for Radiant Church. And I don't know that there is a more critical subject that we can be discussing in the body of Christ than who we are in Christ and who our identity is and why that's so important. So I'm honored to share this week. Uh, if you didn't listen to last week's message, it was insane. I was off last week. I watched it on uh, the computer. Uh, what do they call that thing? Computer? Live stream. Thank you. Seth. Watched it on 8-track. Uh, and as I watched, I was like, oh, this is just so good. And so, uh, and Pastor Lee, when he gave me the instructions, was like, just do something out of 2 Corinthians 5. And I was like, okay, so turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, we're going to continue on this idea of identity. But let's just pray real quick and ask the Lord to bless this time. Father, we love you. We ask that your word would enter our hearts and that it would bring light to us, God, that it would bring truth to us. You promised that your word would not return to you void. But God, when it's sent out, it accomplishes what you want to see it do. So I ask, Holy Spirit, minister to every single person in this room, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Second Corinthians 5, 17, you probably know this. I used it a few weeks ago, even at our baptism message, but it says this, Paul writing, and I would encourage you, read the whole chapter. Second Corinthians 5 is amazing. Um, but for time's sake, he gets to this point where he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So he has this idea of saying, look, something dramatic happens to us when we are in Christ, when we step from our identity being in Adam and sin in the world into our identity being in Christ. And so we're going to look at that today. Like, what does that mean for us as Christians to be in Christ and to have the old things pass away and to have everything in our life become new? Because at the end of the day, at our core, who we believe we are is going to affect everything that we do in our lives, both in the natural and in the spiritual realm. The Bible says this in Proverbs 23, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As you think, so you are. If who you believe you are is going to determine everything about the direction you go. And so the question I want to ask us tonight is, who do you think you are? And that's a question we hear sometimes when maybe somebody's like overstepped their authority or somebody's, you know, uh, being, I don't know, judgmental or something like that. Like, who do you think you are? But honestly, I want you to ask yourself, who do you think you are? In fact, look at your neighbor right now and say, who do you think you are? 
Say it meaner this time. <laughs> Who do you think you are? So many things, as Pastor Lee said last week, want to define us, want to mark us, want to establish our identity in this world. And his, he, he laid out so beautifully, social media and so many things are just bombarding us with, with images and with ideas of this is who you are, this is what's important, this is what's gonna fulfill you. And the reality is all of those things are nothing compared to what God says that we are. They, they aren't supposed to have the weight that God's word has, that God's presence has, that God says that we are. Um, my son, he was just turned five, but when he was four years old, he was at school on the east side in Detroit, and I picked him up one day, and we're in the car, and he says, Daddy, a boy at school today said I called me stupid. And you know, you have that like, you know, that feeling, I will whip that kid, you know, I had, but I kept it together. <laughs> and I said, he called you stupid? And he said, yeah. And I said, and what did you say? And my son, and I didn't train him on this, but in the back seat of the car, he says, I told him, no, I'm not. I'm Eric John Zondervan. <laughs> I know, right? And in my heart, I was like, come on. That's what I'm talking about. Somebody tries to say, I'm not stupid. I'm Eric John Zondervan. And he always uses his middle name. I love it all the time. <laughs> I'm Eric John Zondervan. Listen, when you know who you are, you'll know what to do. You'll know how to live. You'll know what God wants to do in your life. Our identity is the starting point for everything that God wants to do in our lives. And the problem is, many Christians today don't recognize or don't realize or don't fully grasp who they are in Christ. And, and I say that in this way, like sometimes I'll get a phone call and someone will say, hey, Pastor John, I have a friend and they're going through this issue and they have this thing going on. Would you pray for them? Or I want you to pray for them. And I understand that sometimes that's an honor thing and, and I'm not saying that's always bad, but there's also times when, when I hear that I know that what this person is thinking is, I really want you to pray because you're the pastor and I'm just a student, I'm just a stay-at-home mom, I'm just a bank teller, whatever it is. There's this idea that if you pray, something really great's gonna happen and it's gonna be more powerful and they don't recognize, listen, in the kingdom of God, there are no second-class Christians. The spirit of God is not stronger in me than it's in anyone else in this room. If you are in Christ, then the Bible says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive inside of you in this exact moment. If you are in Christ, you have access, the Bible says, to come boldly before the presence of God, before the throne of grace, to ask for help in your time of need. If you are in Christ, you have access to the name of Jesus Christ, which we sang about that every knee will bow at, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So listen to me, first things first, when it comes to your identity, don't label yourself in any way, shape, or form a second-class Christian to anybody else. The same spirit that was raised Jesus from the dead is alive inside of you today, okay? So that's important, right? So listen, here, here's the question, what does that mean? What does that look like for me if I wanna make changes in 2018? If I wanna change the direction of my life? You know, we talk about this season of prayer and fasting and I want God to do something powerful. In fact, I got a couple texts from some people who said that exact thing, um, saying basically, look, I don't feel like I'm where I wanna be and I know I gotta grow so much more and I'm not the father I wanna be and I don't read the Bible enough and all of these sort of external things they pointed to as if to say, now I wanna change those things, I wanna change those things. But listen, when we talk about our identity and I want you to write this down, you have to remember your position is what will determine your performance. Your position, you are in Christ. And because you are in Christ, listen to me, you are accepted and you are loved unconditionally by God no matter what's happening in your life when you are in Christ. But so many times as Christians, we want to focus on and set a position, our performance. Well, I'm not doing enough. I don't read my Bible as much as other people do. I know I, I struggle with these issues and I can't imagine anyone else has these problems. The enemy tries to isolate us and get us to simply look at what we're doing instead of really who we are. And our performance is not 
our position. It's not who we are. And that's hard sometimes to grasp because in our Western world, everything revolves around performance uh, in our society. It starts when you're really young. I remember being a fourth grader and trying out for basketball at Seymour Christian School, and I got cut because I was ch- nervous and I was choking instead of making my layups, but Greg Deephouse, my friend, he made the team, and we played all the time, and I could beat Greg Deephouse. You know what I mean? But in the moment, I didn't perform. And what happens is if you perform well at the tryouts, you make the team. If you don't, Airbud makes the team, and a dog is better at basketball than you are, okay? So just live with that, John. It's okay. No, but, and then school, what do we tell children? What do we tell our kids? And listen, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but we tell them if you perform well, if you do good, if you get good grades, then you can get a scholarship. Then you can get financial aid, whatever that looks like. And then it doesn't change much for us as adults. We grow up and we think, if I outperform my peers, if I do better, uh, if I beat the budget, if I do the, then I deserve, then I should get, then naturally the promotion or the raise or whatever that looks like. And so everything based in our culture is on performance. But the very first thing, if you really want change in your life, is to recognize your position is in Christ. And everything that happens in your life is out of that, is out of that reality that this is who I am. I'm loved by God. I'm accepted by God. I don't have to prove anything. I don't have to be something that I'm not. Because when you live your life out of performance instead of position, one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to have pride in your life or you're going to have shame in your life. That's, That's the only two possibilities when you focus on your performance. So if you're doing well or if you think you're doing well, then you're going to have pride. Well, I'm a pretty good Christian. I go to church, I serve, I hardly ever come during the third song, I'm usually hearing the first song, you know? And, and, and we have sort of our checklist of things that we do. And that's what the Pharisees did in Jesus' day. They were all about the external. Look at what we do. We keep the law, we wash our hands the right way, we tithe on our mint. Every single thing that you could do externally, the Pharisees did. In fact, in Luke 18, there's the prayer of uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector, and tax collectors were hated by everybody, and the Pharisee actually prays this way. He says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I'm not an adulterer, I'm not a thief. Then he probably looked over at the tax collector and was like, and I'm not like that tax collector. Thank God I'm not like him, right? I do this, I do this, and he starts rattling off his resume and all the things that he does. And sometimes that's our our experience with God is through our performance. That's honestly, I grew up in a church that was a lot like that. We had certain things that as a family we just didn't do on Sundays. We didn't go out to eat on Sundays. Again, because we didn't want other people to have to work on Sundays, that was our thinking. So we didn't go out to eat, I couldn't ride my bike on Sundays, we didn't stay over at anyone's house. A big one was we never mowed the lawn on Sundays. We always got that done on Saturdays because Sundays was a day of rest. It was like a Sabbath, which again, I'm not saying is a bad thing, but I'm not kidding you when I say there would be times where we would honestly look at my neighbor who would be mowing the lawn on Sunday and he would mow the lawn without a shirt on, right? And we would just stare at him through our kitchen window. Like, I can't believe you're mowing the grass on Sunday, you sweaty Philistine. Don't you even love Jesus? You know, we would, and so we had, <laughs> we had these things that we did that we thought made us better than other people. But, but that's not who we are. But then the flip side of that, and I think happens more often than pride, is when you live by performance, is you have shame in your life. Too often we have this idea that I can't go before God because I'm not good enough. I have too many issues in my life. I struggle in these areas. I've been divorced, I've made mistakes, I've all of these things, and in our hearts, we don't feel worthy to have God love us the way that he says he does. And so we struggle with shame, and shame is one of the greatest tools of the enemy in keeping people living below the standard that God has for their lives. We never have the confidence, we never have the boldness, we never have the reality of who we are in Christ because we're constantly, constantly being shamed and guilted by things that we've done or things that have happened to us. And because we're not remembering, it's not about my performance first, it's about my position. I'm in 
Christ. And so we don't want that, obviously. We don't want pride. We don't have shame. So what does that mean? Here's what I want to explain to you in the few moments that we have, is that you, yes, you're accepted and you're loved by God, but you don't have to be somebody you're not in order for God to love you and for God to bless you. That's, that's the crux of tonight. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to put on a mask. Let's be honest, so many times we go before God and we're not transparent like we maybe want to be or we sort of go through the motions or we're just not sure, gosh, can I really bear my soul in this moment and not be judged and not feel guilt and really still be loved and accepted by God when I have all these things going on? And I'm here to tell you tonight that that, in those moments, that is where the freedom will come in your life. That is where the identity will mark you for who you truly are. If you brought your Bibles, turn to Genesis, first book of the Bible. We're going to look at a story of Jacob and Esau. If you grew up in Sunday school, you know who they are. Uh, they're brothers. Genesis chapter 25, Isaac and his wife Rebekah are barren. They can't have kids. And so Rebecca prays this prayer and she says to her husband, give me children or I'll die. I mean, you know, that's a lot of pressure, right? Uh, and so they pray and they go before the Lord and she, she gets pregnant. And of course they didn't have sonograms and things like that, they didn't know it, but there were twins in there. And the twins named Jacob and Esau were literally fighting in the womb already. How many of you have children that were probably fighting at one point in the womb? Okay, yes, my kids. But they're, they're, they're going at it and then they're born and the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 25, it says uh, in verse 27, it says, or in 24, it says, when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her room. The first came out red, and his body was like a hairy cloak. So they called him Esau. And then afterward, his brother came out with his hand actually holding Esau's heel, and they called him Jacob which means deceiver. So I think Esau means hairy, and Jacob means deceiver. Isaac was six years old. Verse 27, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Verse 28, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So you have these two brothers. Esau is the quintessential barbarian, hairy warrior, right? He hunts with his bare hands, he's like Rambo. And his dad loves him, the Bible says. The father loves Esau, but Jacob was different. He dwelled in tents, he was mild-mannered, he had a different personality, and he lived his whole life thinking, I can't gain the love of my father. I don't have his approval. I'm not like Esau. I'm not like the one that God loves. I have too many issues, I'm too different, I have too many things going on. And so he lived that, his life that way, and if you know the story, Esau, who was the firstborn, was out hunting. He got super hungry, and he said to his brother, he said, give me something to eat. And Jacob was making stew, and he said, only if you give me your birthright. Now, the birthright was what the firstborn son had, obviously, by birth, but it was a huge deal in Old Testament times. It required the double blessing. You got the double inheritance. You got the promise of carrying the name of your family. I mean, it was a massive deal. And in that moment... Esau, because he was hungry, he just said, here, you can have it. I'll give it to you. Just give me that stew. And so he ate it. And then in chapter 27, what we see is the time comes for Isaac, the father, to do the firstborn blessing over his sons. And so he isn't aware that Esau sold his birthright, but he wants to do the blessing. Look, at, I'm going to read verse 27, and we're just going to walk through, or chapter 27, we're going to walk through this. It says, when Isaac, that's the dad, was old and his eyes were dim, he called Esau, his older son, and he said to him, my son, here I am, he said, behold, I'm old, and I don't know when I'm gonna die, so take your weapons and quiver and bow, and go to the field and hunt game for me and prepare delicious food like I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat it, and my soul will bless you before I die. So Jacob is telling his son Esau, go hunt, make me some food, I'm gonna eat it, and then I'm gonna bless you. But Rebekah, the mom, was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when he went to the fields, Rebekah said to Jacob, your father was speaking to your brother Esau, and he said, bring me food and prepare me delicious food, and I'll eat it, and I'll bless you before the Lord, before I die. So therefore, my son, as I command you, you go to the flock and bring me two good young goats, so that I may prepare them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat, and he will bless you before he dies. So basically, she's saying, you're going to trick your dad into getting the blessing. 
But Jacob said to his mother, behold, Esau's hairy and I'm smooth. What if my father feels me and he thinks I'm mocking him and he bring a curse upon me instead of a blessing? And mom said, your curse can be on me. Only do what I'm telling you to do. So he went, did it, brought his mother who prepared the delicious food such as his father loved. Verse 15, I want you to underline this in your Bible. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and she put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goat she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food that she had prepared in the hand of her son Jacob. So here we are. Jacob's going in. Esau's out hunting. Jacob gets some goats right out of the pantry or whatever, puts those together, makes those. And literally, this is a huge deal. This isn't like, hey, let's play a chick on dad. It's April Fool's. No, this is a massive deal. And so he's like, look, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go into the father's presence like this. I'm, I'm nervous. I'm, I'm smooth and Esau's hairy. So literally, you know your brother's hairy when they like shave a sheep and they put that on your hands and your neck. And then she puts, but the most important thing she does is she clothes Jacob in Esau's shirt and his clothes. And verse 18, here's the moment of truth, chapter 27. So he went in to his father's room and he's gonna be nervous. He's gonna be a little scared. How many of you know sometimes when we go before God, we're a little nervous, we're not sure what to expect. And so he said to his father, my father, I'm just kidding, he wasn't that scared, my father. And he said, here I am, who are you? And Jacob said to his father, I'm Esau, your firstborn. So he's lying, I've done as you told me. Sit up, eat of my game, and quick, bless me, let's do this. Verse 20, but Isaac said to his son, how is it that you found it so quickly? Um... Because the Lord your God has granted me success. Dude, you're digging a hole here, bro. This is bad. <laughs> then Isaac said to Jacob, he said to his son, please come near that I may feel you to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him. And listen to what he said. The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And then verse 24, he doubles down. He said, are you really my son? I am. Then he said, bring it to me. Bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate it and he brought him wine and he drank it. And then his father said to him, come near, kiss me, my son. Verse 27, so Jacob came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, see, the smell of my son is the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. Listen, here's why I love this story. Not because Jacob was lying, not because he had to pull some tricks, not because Rebecca was being shady as a mom, none of those things, but it's this. There's so many times as Christians, we think that we have to somehow put, be like someone else, or we have to somehow be something we're not to go into the presence of the Father and feel his love and get his blessing. Many times that happens to us as Christians, let's be honest. We think, no, I know I've struggled there and I've messed that up and I've done that, and we don't have this, this confidence to go before. God. And just like Jacob, who came before his father, I believe God, who wants to bless us, says to himself, I hear the voice of Jacob. I hear the voice of John, who doesn't get it right, who screwed these things up, who's, who's, who's always you know, missing the mark. But come here. Let me smell you. Let me feel you. I, I hear Jacob, but I smell and I feel the sun that the father loves. Remember, Jacob loved Esau. And so when, or Isaac loved Esau. So when Jacob put his clothes on, remember his mom put his garments on him, he dressed him up like his brother. And it was in that moment that the father didn't say, hey, hey, I, I don't want anything to do. He said, no, 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 come closer, come closer, let me kiss you. And he began to say, no, the voice that I hear might not be who I think it is, but you're dressed in the garments of the son that I love. And listen, in Christ, every time you are in Christ, you are dressed in the garments of God. You are dressed in the robes of righteousness. Romans 13, 11 says this, and put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And Galatians 3, 27 says this, as many as been baptized into Jesus Christ have put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what I want to tell you as someone who's going before God, who's someone who's getting your identity into who you are in Christ is this, that you don't have to dress up 
like somebody else. You don't have to be your brother. You don't have to be somebody you think has a direct line with God. You're already dressed in the robes of righteousness of the Son that God the Father loves. And every time you come to his presence, you don't have to shake, you don't have to worry, you don't have to be fearful. I don't care what happened 10 minutes ago or 10 years ago. Every time the Father says, come here, I want to love you and I want to bless you because you are the Son that I love. Every single time. Believe that, church. Amen. Believe that. Believe that. Believe that. You're dressed in the righteousness of God. Our righteousness apart from Christ is like filthy rags. Our works, our performance, they mean nothing. But every time we come into his presence in the reality of who we are in Christ, everything changes. Everything changes. And the Father will bless you. And the last part is this. So you don't have to be someone else. You don't have to dress up. But I also love about this story is that it, only God can truly change your identity. Yeah. Only God. Listen, so Jacob pulls this trick and then Esau shows up and he's got game and he wants the father to eat and the father says, who are you? I'm Esau, your firstborn. He says, wait, what? I already blessed Esau. And he was like, no, that was my brother. And he was like, sorry, he really is gonna be blessed. This is, this is a big deal. And then so Esau literally starts crying. Don't you have a blessing for me? And if you read the blessing that he had for Esau, it's jank. It's not very good. I'm sorry. He's like, away from the fat of the field will you be. I mean, it was terrible. I mean, it was not even like runner-up participation trophy status. It was like you get very little. Uh, and so Esau was mad, obviously, and he was angry. And he said to himself, after the period of mourning for my father, I'm going to kill Jacob. And so Jacob's mother caught word of that and he had to leave, he had to flee in the middle of the night. And what you see in the following chapters is that Jacob begins to live in fear of the decisions that he made, in fear of Esau, in fear of being found out, in fear of, of what he had done and his past was following him everywhere that he went. And what I feel like God's saying tonight is too many of us as Christians have allowed our past to try to identify who we are our past to determine our identity in Christ. Second part of 2 Corinthians 5, it says, therefore, if you're in Christ, this is who you are. You're a new creation. And then the second part is this, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The key to your identity is recognizing that your past does not have the authority to dictate who you are in your future. You need to hear that so many people are bound by their past. Guilt, shame, and regret are three of the key components the enemy uses to keep every Christian bound. And you know why? Because all of them are tied to your past. That's what he wants to do. He wants you constantly looking over your shoulder, constantly second guessing, constantly wallowing in maybe some of the mistakes that you've made in your life. And as someone who's been in ministry a long time, I see that all the time. People will come in and they'll talk about things that happened to them or decisions that they made 10, 20, 30 years ago. And what I want you to know tonight is that in Christ, your past has no authority over your future, none. There's some beautiful verses in Romans chapter eight where it says we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, and he says, what can separate us from the love of God? Can peril, can storms, can sickness, can any of these things? He says, neither things present nor things to come can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ. And then again, in 1 Corinthians chapter three, Paul begins to talk about what we have in Christ, our inheritance. He says, this is what you have. You have life, you have death, the power over death. This is, this is your inheritance in Christ. And then he says, you have the things that are present and you have the things that are to come. All of these are yours, and you are in Christ. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3. And listen, in both of those instances, notice he never says that you have a right to your past. He says you have the things that are present and the things that are to come, but you don't have legal right to your past. And I'm telling you, that's because it's already been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
Your past does not belong to you. Your past cannot identify you because your past doesn't even exist in the eyes of God. It's the lie of the enemy to say, no, those decisions, those things, those opportunities that you missed, that's who you really are. And God says, I don't even see that. Every time that you go to your past apart from the blood of Jesus Christ, you're going to something that's no longer true, that's no longer who you are, that God doesn't even recognize. Your future and your present belong to you. Who you are, who God is creating you to become. I know the things I have for you, things to prosper you and and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. But every time we reach into our past, we open ourselves up to deception. So listen, your past can no longer have a voice in your life. It can no longer haunt you. It can no longer cripple you. It can no longer identify who you are. You have to let it go. And listen, in Genesis chapter 32, what happens with Jacob? I love this part of the story. So he's running from his past. He's afraid. He goes and he marries uh, Rachel, and then he has to work seven more years to marry Leah, Leah. And then he has this revelation where he's about to meet his brother in chapter 32. And he's scared. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He's sending gifts ahead of time. He's, he's, he's trying to appease his brother as he's done his entire life. And in verse 22 of chapter 32, listen to what it says. So the same night, Jacob arose and he took his wives, his servants, his children, and he crossed the ford of Jabbok. It was a river. And he took everyone and he sent them across the stream with everything else that he had. And verse 24 says, and Jacob was left alone. I want you to underline that in your Bible. Everything that was a distraction, everything that that could try to identify who he was, he, he sent those ahead, and it says that he was alone in this moment. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. This man is really Jesus. It's a Christophany and and. Scholars believe it happens throughout the Old Testament that this really was God who was wrestling with him. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go. So I just want you to think about this. Jacob's wrestling with his identity. He's wrestling with who he is. He's wrestling with the the things that have happened in his past. He's alone with God. And it says... Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And in verse 27, and God said to him, what is your name? It's in this moment. He's alone with God. He's wrestling with everything that's going on in his life. And God asks him the question, who do you think you are? What is your name? And he says, Jacob, I'm a deceiver. I'm a supplanter. I've lived my whole life undermining people to get ahead, trying to make things happen myself. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with man, and you have prevailed. Listen, every time that you will get transparent with God, that you will get vulnerable with God, that you will get alone with God, you give him the opportunity to truly define who you are in Christ to mark your identity. Jacob came with his issues, with his shame, with the things that he had done, and when he was alone with God, God said, no, that's not who you are. You might have grown your whole life thinking, I'm a deceiver, I'm a supplanter, I don't have what it takes, but in one moment, God said to him, no, your name is Israel. You're an overcomer. You have prevailed. You're a prince with God. And what I want you, everyone in this room, to realize going into 2018 is this, is you don't have to perform to gain the approval of God. Of course it matters what we do. Of course as we surrender our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we grow in obedience and the trajectory of our lives follows hard after Christ. Those things will happen. But if you are in this place and you think that you can perform well enough to earn the love of God, you are going to have roller coaster Christianity your whole life where you think one day I might be good enough, the next day, no, I'm messed up, I gotta stay away from God till I do better. And I'm telling you, every day you wake up and you confess, I am in Christ. 
I am an overcomer. I am an ambassador. I am salt and light in this world. I am a masterpiece. God says you're the workmanship that he created before the foundation of the world to do the good works that he has planned for you. And when you begin to live your life out of that overflow, then the lies of the enemy, the lies of your past, the things that want to define you, they don't have the power or the magnitude because instead you're focused on who you are in Jesus Christ. That's my prayer for you in 2018, is that the reality of who you are in Christ becomes a reality in your heart. And you don't have to strive, and you don't have to clap, crawl, and, and, and dig, and, and, and do better. Instead, you rest in the reality that Jesus Christ, and his goodness, and his power, and his might, are driving you into your future. Will you guys stand with me? I just want to pray with you. I just want you to close your eyes. And the Bible says in Psalm 116, David said this. He said, pour your heart out before the Lord, for he can be trusted. There's those moments where we really do have to just ask God to examine our hearts and we have to be real with God. We don't, we don't have to be something we're not. We just have to say, God, I know there's this in my life that, that I've tried to battle on my own. Or maybe there's this in my life that I've allowed to define me, but it's not truth. It's not who you are. It's not what you said. You cannot afford to have one thought about who you are that God doesn't have about who you are. Not one. You don't get your own opinion about who you are. You're in Christ. And God says, when you are, you're a masterpiece, you're an overcomer, you're an ambassador, and you're unequivocally and unconditionally loved by God the Father. And with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to ask you, if you're here and you know, and maybe there's some things in your past that you haven't been able to let go of, maybe there's some things that the enemy's tried to use to define you and to keep you from all that God has for you, and you know today, I need to let those things go. Behold, the old has gone, all things have become new. God wants to do a new thing in your heart in 2018. He wants to do a new thing in your family. He wants to do a new thing in your finances. He wants to create an atmosphere for the power and presence of God to be the driving force of your life. Everything stemming from the overflow of who you are in Christ, but it takes a decision. You have to get alone with God, and you have to say, that might have been my name, but God, give me a new name. Let me hear you say, no, this is who you are. And if you're in this place with every head bowed, and you say, that's me, we're going to pray together, and we're going to ask God to do a new thing. We're going to ask God to start a new creation in you because today you're in Christ and you say, John, just include me in that prayer. I know I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to let go of the past and just raise your hand right now and we're gonna pray together. Raise your hand, keep it, up. Keep it raised. Don't wait, today's the day. Today is where the presence of God can do the miracle. The faithful God is in this place. Awesome, keep your hand up. Awesome, you can put your hands down. Let's all pray this together. Say, dear heavenly Father, say it out loud. I come in Jesus' name, and I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. Today, I choose to believe that I am in Christ. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Today, I turn my back on my past. It will not define me. It has no authority, and I declare I am a new creation in Christ, in Jesus' name.